Let's welcome our audience around the world. Hey, on this Memorial Day weekend, thank you for tuning in today. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, I'd like to begin reading with verse number 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It is, it's not easily provoked and thinketh no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there shall be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which was in part shall be done away. Amen. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Amen. So now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth, continues, now is here with us three things. Faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest, the superior of all three of them is charity. Thank you for reading the scripture with me today. I want to preach a message and I'll bring it around to Memorial Day weekend if you'll stay with me. I want to preach on the subject of the look of love. Or if you're hermeneutically desired to designed this message, it would be called, I guess, seeing the invisible. Before I tell you what charity or love is, let me explain to you very quickly what it is not, because there is definitely a misinterpretation of what real love is. Real love is not a lingo. What I mean by that, it's not just a word. It's not just a language. You can say love with your lips, but not mean it in your heart. You remember when Jesus was dealing with the religious crowd, he said to them, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if a young person says they love their mom and dad, but goes against everything they're trying to teach them, that's evident that they don't know what love is all about. Because love is not something you demonstrate with your mouth. Love is something you demonstrate in your everyday life, respecting those that have authority over you. So love is more than just a lingo. May I say to you, love is not lust. We are living in such a dramatized world with affection and emotions that this generation sadly has not been taught the balance of what real love is. You hear people say, two teenagers got caught making love. No, they was not making love. They were making lust. But we have so programmed in our minds through television and the internet that love is sexuality. That love has to deal with fornication or adultery or an extramarital affair. But God condemns every one of those actions. Here's what the Bible said. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whores and whoremongers, God will judge. Any kind of physical relationship out of the boundaries of marriage has always been and always will be considered wicked in the sight of God. And any sexual relationship between two individuals that are of the same gender is just an abomination. It's always been an abomination. That is not love. That is a lust that is burning within them, according to Romans chapter number 1. But may I say to you that love is not leverage either. See, people use that terminology, for instance, when kids want something, they'll say to their parents, well, if you love me, you'd let me have it. You better be glad that my dad's not your dad because he'd let you have it all right and give you to the number 10 to get back up off the floor again. But people do that all the time. If you love me, you'll do so and so for me. If you love me, you will allow me to do that. That's a misconception. That's the leverage of love. And that's not what the Bible is talking about. Love is a deep, deep affection. It's precious. It's devoted. It's compassion. It means to cling to or to be consumed with one's presence, acceptance, and affection. 
So I guess to you on this Memorial Day weekend, my question or the thought of this message would be, if the emotion of love was visible, what would it look like? You see, love is like the wind and it's like electricity. Though we are not able to see it with the human eye, we can definitely see the effects of it. Love is the same way. I want to demonstrate to you what the Bible calls love and see if you even know what real, true, godly affection is. Number one, love is very strong. The Bible said in Romans chapter number 8 that neither death or life or angles or principalities or powers or angels or things present or things to come nor height nor death or any other creature, here's what the Bible said, shall ever separate us from the love of God. We are held together to God with a strong love. God's love was strong enough to save us. It's strong enough to secure us. And it's strong enough to sustain us and to keep us in his family. No experience or emotion is stronger than true love. True love accepts challenges. It endures hardships. And it overcomes all obstacles. Love doesn't give up, quit, and retreat. Love's not a sissy. Love's not weak. Love is not anemic. And when people have strong love, they're able to go through things together. That's why when I counsel young couples before they get married, I ask them, what is love? And like most, they have no idea. They're infatuated, she's beautiful, and I want to get married and go to bed, and we're going to live happy ever after. Man, are you in a dream world. What is love anyway? When you have a real godly committed love, it's strong enough to get you through the hardships of marriage. I was talking to somebody the other day and they'd been married for 65 years and I said, you hardly hear of that anymore because people don't accept the hardships and the valleys and the decisions and the misunderstandings and the emotions and the depressions and the anxiety and family and drama and financial pressures and health declining. And if you don't have a strong love, your relationship begins to, t to deteriorate when things don't go right. Many, many times when younger couples have a tragedy within their marriage, even physically or emotionally or financially, the first thing they do is say, I'm not happy anymore. Or they say stand, saying stuff like this, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. What that means is I'm dumber than a box of rocks, and I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I want out of this relationship. And whether you clap or not, I'm going to preach. But real love is strong. If you're going to jump out of every relationship and every job and every family because things don't go right, you're going to be doing a kangaroo life for the rest of your life. Love includes struggles, and you have to be strong. Your love has to be developed. Your love has to be mature, because if it's not, then you're not going to make it through the hard times. I love my wife with all of my heart the day I married her, but 46 years later, I can tell you, I love her more now than I did the day I married her. Now, how does that happen? Because we've developed a relationship through struggles and hard times and valleys and dark hours, and we stayed together. We were strong. We held out. I told my wife, she's beautiful, but she's aggressive. Don't you let her fool you. I said, honey, I believe if I cheated on you, God would kill me. You know what she said to me? He wouldn't have to. <laughs> now you think about it. That's a preacher's wife. So I'm telling you, I'm living proof. I ain't never run around on my wife. But love is strong. May I say to you, and I want to get into this, you've got to listen to this. Love is spiritual. This chapter of love, you must understand that it is pinned between two chapters of spiritual gifts. Chapter number 12 and chapter number 14 of 1 Corinthians, the whole chapters deal with spiritual gifts. And right in the middle, chapter 13, God puts a whole chapter dealing with love. Why did he do that? Because it gives a proper balance to keep the gifts of chapter 12 and 14 from being misused. It was Adrian Rogers or David Jeremiah, I can't remember which one I was reading after, when it was talking about the gifts in chapter 12 and 14, it says, isn't it amazing that everybody wants the showy gifts? They want the ones that everybody else can see. They want to speak in tongues. They want the gift of prophecy. They want the gifts of recognition. And so when you love right, it'll keep balanced the gifts that God gives us in our life. It reminds us that no matter what gift God gives us, without 
the center purpose of our motivation being love. It's useless. And Paul said it's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Because gifts are what we do. But love is what we are. Gifts will come and go. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. But there abideth faith, hope, and love. It'll be there when all the other gifts are gone. It's superior to any other gift God could ever give you is the gift and the ability to love like God loves. Love is spiritual. May I say to you that love has a tendency to spread. It develops. It reaches out. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, here's what the Bible said. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. That word shed abroad means to go outside the boundaries. It means to get into the highways. It means to spread, to scatter, to be stretched. It, it gives the definition of a dam being so over flooded with water that it just breaks open. And brother Guy, what the Bible is telling us is when we experience the love of God, we can't keep it within ourselves. That love is so real, it's so mature, it wants to spread out. It wants to reach others. It wants to help others. It wants to pray with others. It wants to encourage others. Because real love has the ability to spread to other people. Now, before I was converted, my father and I had a lot of issues. And I can honestly tell you most of the problem was mine. I had made my mind to go up a direction that he did not necessarily approve of. But on the same token, he had taken his life in a direction that I wouldn't have necessarily approved of either. So during the transaction of teenage years, when you think you know everything, a vast distance began to be created between me and my dad. And it carried on for quite a while. And the older I got and the older he got, the further the distance became. But on November 22nd, 1975, at 15 minutes after 8, I stood up in the back of a church. I didn't wait for invitation because I didn't know what an invitation was. And I came down to the front of the church and fell on my knees. And before the first person ever touched me, I had done received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and became a born-again Christian that night. Now, I said that to say this. When I stood up, people were hugging me and crying and, and shouting and running around the building. But the first thing that happened to me, Brother Joe, the first thing that happened to me is I fell in love with my daddy. Nobody had to tell me. Nobody said, now look, you got to love everybody. I didn't know any scripture, but I fell in love. And after all the jubilee and the shouting, 13 of us got saved that night. Revival broke out. But when all that was settled in the back of my heart, I couldn't wait to get home because my dad had been drinking very heavy that night and I knew he would be drunk. And so when I got home, my mother met me in the kitchen coming out of the bathroom, and I asked where my dad was, and she said, he's in bed, and just leave him alone. I said, I cannot go to bed till I speak to my daddy. I was under psychiatric care, and the psychologist told my dad, he said, one of these days that boy's going to flip just like that, just like that. And when he flips, he'll never be the same. Well, my aunt and uncle bought me the biggest King James Bible you'd ever seen in your life. You almost got a free wheelbarrow with it to carry it home. And I went running in my daddy's bedroom with that big Bible in my hand and tears running down my face. And I jumped up in the middle of the bed like a wild man. Dad leaned over and turned the light on and he sat up and he said, yep. That's what the psychiatrist told me. It happened just like that. And you'll never be the same. I said, you got that right, daddy? I said, I asked God to save me tonight and just like that, God has changed my life and I'll never be the same. And with liquor on his breath, I laid that Bible down and I put my arm around his neck and I said, Daddy, I want to tell you I'm sorry. I'm far from a son that you could be proud of. And I've hurt you and I've said things I shouldn't have said and I, I am so sorry. And I can't go to bed tonight until I tell you something. And Adam, for the first time in my life, I told my daddy I loved him. Amen. And my daddy was lost. And I would preach five and ten minutes from his house and he would never come near me. He never come to see me get baptized. I came home and told him that God had called me to preach. 
And he said, no young preacher ought to have a drunk for her daddy. I'll never drink another drop of liquor as long as I live. And for years, I preached all over this world and couldn't even get my own daddy. One night, he stuttered into a hospital, very sick. And I went by to see him, and I was leaving to go to a revival meeting. And my pastor called me and said, you need to turn around and go back to the hospital. Your daddy needs you now. I thought he was dying, so I spun around and I went back. And I went in the hospital, and I grabbed him by the hand, and I said, Daddy, what's wrong? He said, I've got a third-grade education. You know what my life has been? And I just wanted to know, would God save me in this hospital room today? And I led my daddy to Jesus. And it wasn't because I'm a good preacher. And it wasn't because I was preaching all over the world. And it wasn't because I was a businessman. And it wasn't because I was his son. You know what made my daddy want Jesus? Because I loved him in spite of his lifestyle, in spite of his liquor bottle, in spite of his language. Down underneath all of that was a soul that Jesus bled and died for. And I knew if I was going to reach him, it was going to be with the love of God because it spreads. It was Paul that told the Philippian jailer, you and your whole household is going to get saved. I remember preaching under a tent one night, and Daddy was sitting beside me. And I got up to preach, and he grabbed the back of my coat, and he pulled me down. He said, I'll tell you something. If you'll preach on hell like you did when I used to come, there'll be somebody walk this aisle tonight. And I didn't know that was the last time he would ever hear me preach. But my daddy's in heaven because I spread the love of God. You know what this world's looking for? They're sick of lust. They're sick of fornicating and shacking up and all the other hell that goes with it. You know what they need to see? Somebody that loves them with a godly love that looks over their vomit, looks over their tattoos, looks over their long hair, look over their filthy language, look over the liquor on their, bo- on their breath, look over the pills in their pocket and the pot on their table because Jesus loves them as much as he's ever loved us hallelujah love spreads the one I want to get to this morning because of this weekend occasion love sacrifices the Bible said in John chapter 15 and verse number 13 greater love hath no man than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends Jesus is the ultimate example of unconditional sovereign godly love for he loved us enough to take our place on the cross. On this Memorial Day weekend, how can we forget those that paid the supreme price with their lives so that we could sit here today in freedom? Always remember, freedom is never free. It's a high price to enjoy liberty and justice for all. It's a sad day that our schools don't even teach our children what Memorial Day and Veterans Day is all about. Memorial Day, we honor those that gave their life. Veterans Day, we honor those that are still among us. Blood has run waist deep across the face of this earth so that we could be free. In World War I, 116,516 people died. In World War II, 405,399 people died. In the Korean War, 36,516 people died. In Vietnam, 58,209 people came home in body bags. In Iraq, 6,713 men and women laid in the desert sands and bled out and died. I'm saying to you, just in those wars, not including the civil wars and the other conflicts, over 650,000 people died to preserve our freedom. That's why you should never sew an American flag on the seat of your britches. You should never burn an American flag. Blood has run waist deep across the face of this earth so that you and I can enjoy liberty and freedom. Because love is willing to sacrifice. David was a young teenage boy that was shipped over to Germany to fight on the front lines of World War II. 
He wrote a letter to his mom and dad the day before he was to confront enemy lines. He said, and I quote, Should I go under, referring to dying, therefore I want you to know that I went without any terror of death. And that my chief worry is the grief my death will bring those that so are dear to me. The very next morning, David, with a, along with untold thousands of American soldiers, stormed the German lines. And on that day, 7,000 died, and David was one of them. There was a mother that got a letter, I think it was from Wisconsin, four years after her son had died. Tommy Kennedy was 21 years old, and he was drafted, and he was in World War II, and he was taken captive by the Japanese. He was sent off for three solid years to the Japanese prison camps, and there he was beat, mutilated, and starved. After Tommy Kennedy was nothing but skeleton and bone, they put him on a ship called the Ship of Hell. And there Tommy dehydrated, starved to death, and died. Just prior to dying, he found another POW, and he said, if you get out of here alive, make sure my mother gets this message. It was delivered by that Conrad four years later. And this is what Tommy said to his mother. It's pretty hard to check out this way. I don't even have a fighting chance. But the truth is, none of us can live forever. Mommy, I'm not afraid to die. I just hate the thought of not seeing you again. And if I could, all I would desire today is to feel warm one more time or to just have a drink of water. I'm loving and I'm waiting for you in the world beyond. Signed, Tommy. And when I read stuff like this, and then I, I, read, I meet conscientious objectors and people parading in the streets and people saying how much they hate the military and hate the police and they hate America. I, I don't want to be mean because that's not what this message is about. But why don't they pack their freaking belongings and go somewhere else in another country? If America's not worth fighting for, she's not worth living in. And by the way, I wasn't going to say this, but I guess I am. Shame, shame on the United States military that the other day they put out a promotional to encourage young boys and girls to enter into the military because the numbers are down. You know what the commercial is? A drag queen. A drag queen dancing across the screen like some pedophile pervert. And they're dancing, join, join the military, join the military. Let me tell you something about that crowd. You throw that crowd on a battlefield with their silk panties, their high heels, and their fluffy wigs, they wouldn't last 15 seconds on a stinking battlefield. What are they going to do? Stab them with a fingernail file? Choke them with their nylons? They don't even know what fighting's all about. Perverts didn't build this country. I tell you what built America. Men and women that love the red, white, and blue and honor God and cherish freedom. Because you see, love has no problem sacrificing. My final point is love is a supporter. Love gives you the ability to invest in something. Here's what the Bible said in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world, right? Now watch what happens so that you could see his invisible love. For God so loved the world that he gave. You see, you have no problem giving to something or somebody that you love. How many of you parents sitting here today did without things during your marriage so your kids could have things you never had. And I think we've went overboard a little bit and produced a bunch of spoiled brats. But with that being said, we have no problem doing without because we love our children. 
And because we love them, we have no problem giving them what they need to support them. Is, am I making sense? Love has a tendency to give or to support. Humans have no problem supporting something they believe in. For instance, Brother Ford's here. He's got a car lot. Brother Ford knows he gets these old men that are in their second childhood. This is how he drafts money off these old men. He knows, you know they're in their second childhood. They're about to croak. They got a bedpan and the hearing aid. But he talks them into buying a Corvette. That's how he does stuff. That's how he knows he does it that way. Does it honestly, but still shady. And a guy that has worked all of his life, matter of fact, he has a Corvette. For 99,000, I think he dropped it to 98,000 the other day. 98,000 for one car! I remember when you could buy two houses for $98,000. But he'll find some individual that's got more money than they got mind, and they will come in and gladly pay him $98,000 for a go kart with doors on it. And that's exactly what they are. And if you'll stop that guy, he's in the height of his life. It doesn't matter! that his wife's teeth are falling out and he won't let her get them fixed. Doesn't matter if the lawnmower don't run. I got a fix! And he has no problem putting that much money in it because he loves it. It's the way it's supposed to be. You take women with shoes. Did you know you can only wear one pair at a time? Has that ever crossed your mind? I told my wife, I said, when you die and somebody opens up your closet, they're going to think I was married to an octopus. You can't wear this many shoes... There's something about women with shoes. We'll get in the car, my wife will say, do you see her shoes? No, honey. I don't go to church to look at people's feet. I'm sorry. Oh, they were beautiful. I'm, I'm sorry, honey. I, I, I apologize. I'm not intrigued. With her feet! And women get so loved to shoes, they won't throw them out. My wife has shoes, one of the heels are gone. Gone! Do you know why she won't throw them out? She said, I may get cancer and lose that leg, and I can wear that high heel shoe, and I won't need the other one. <laughs> now, that's what I have to live in every week of my life. I don't want you to lose your leg, honey. Go buy a pair of shoes. It's easier to buy shoes. My daughter's the same way, so she said, uh, I told her, I said, I'm going to take you out and buy you a pair of shoes. So I took her to this big woman's store with her shoes, and I was uncomfortable anyway, but... She put a pair of shoes on, and she said, Dad, these are the ones I like. I said, okay, good. So we went up to the counter, and I said, I'm buying these shoes for my daughter. The lady said, that's $114. I said, whoa. <laughs> I only want one pair, lady. I, I don't want all of them. She said, those are Jessica Simpson shoes. I said, well, give them back to her. If, she, if she's charging $114 to put her name in them, she can have them as far as I'm concerned. But women think nothing of that. But they'll drive 19 miles to save seven cents on steak. <laughs> you men know I'm right. You, you're so henpecked, you won't even back me up. Honey, I'm going to Asheville. They got steak nine cents cheaper. Asheville? Asheville? Yeah, but there's a shoe store there too. See what I'm saying? So we don't mind investing in things we love, right? So I want to turn it and say this in closing. We ought to love the fact that you and I have the privilege of getting the gospel around the world. 